So Emily Chang, thank you so much for joining us today at Prosper Works to talk about your book, Brotopia. Thank um, you. And thank all of you here. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for joining uh, in attendance and our special guests who are here as well for coming to join this really important conversation um, about women in technology and you know more broadly diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, the reason why we invited Emily here today is this is a topic that's of, of real importance to East staff and to, to ProsperWorks generally. And we want to make sure that we're really creating a, a safe place and an environment where we can have these conversations. Um, so while I have the direct experience of being a woman in technology, you know, Emily's book was really meaningful to me in that it, it really, the, in terms of the breadth and depth of information around this, this important topic. Um, you know, as a member of eStaff, I know that we have the responsibility to demonstrate and encourage a culture that fosters inclusion, respect for ideas, and diversity of thought. And I actually, I consider this to be an ethical imperative. Um, and also a great business practice that maps to a few of our key values, including uh, treat our, our team like family, build innovative solutions, and be great at giving and receiving feedback. Um, this is something that I care about really deeply from a personal and professional standpoint, and, and our goal here at the company is to foster a diverse and inclusive environment. Um, because as we've learned in Emily's book, it's actually, it's actually, it helps make a company more successful. Um, and I want to voice my commitment for this topic here, Prosper Works, and basically um, more broadly in the tech community at large. Um, and so we know that, that companies with diverse and inclusive environments are most successful when those efforts are led by grassroots efforts. So I want to thank Nicole Altman for um, her driving this initiative and starting this conversation here at the company. So thank you so much, Nicole. Um, and welcome again to Emily. Thank you. And I didn't realize that people were going to be wearing, have you seen MG shoes? They're so amazing. I cannot. I. <laughs> I hope I can keep up. Yeah. Well, thank you, MG, for that introduction, and thank you all so much for being here. Um, for those who do not know, is it working? Oh, sorry. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, for those that do not know, Emily is the current host and executive producer of Bloomberg Technologies Weekday Show, in addition to having her own segment titled Studio 1.0, both where she highlights innovations and the future of business and tech. Emily has also anchored for CNN in both London and Beijing, where she won five regional Emmys. And for those HBO fans out there, she actually plays herself on the hit show Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, so Emily, we are beyond thrilled and humbled to have you here with us. Um, to start, we do have some questions that um, are more specific to you and your research, and thought it would be beneficial also to have some two of our own powerhouse females join in on the conversation um, and shed some light based on their experiences. So we have MG, who is our VP of Finance and Operations, and we have Jessica, who is our Senior Engineering Manager. So thank you both for joining as well. Oh, sorry. Um, so we'll just dive right in. Emily, I really enjoyed reading your book, and I just want to know what made you think this is the time I need to start a book with? Wow. This topic. Um, well, first of all, I had no idea we would be in this moment, this cultural moment. This was, I decided to write the book before Trump, before me too. So much was different. Um, this was two and a half years ago. And, you know, the lack of women in this industry is something that I noticed for a long time. Um, but, you know, when I launched my show eight years ago, it was really about trying to get people to come and sit in the chair. Uh, and then over time, as you know, I sort of became more courageous about asking people, what are you doing about this? You know, why is no one talking about the fact that like women account for 7% of venture capitalists and hold 25% of jobs across the industry and companies run by women get 2% of venture capital funding? It makes no sense in an industry that calls itself a meritocracy. Um, and so, you know, I would ask people and, and they would give their politically correct answer on television and then they'd get off the set and like, spill it, you know, sort of what they really thought. Um, and I knew that there was a lot more there, but it was really difficult to get people to talk about it. Um, and then at the end of 2015, I was interviewing a very prominent investor, chapter five. Um, 
And, you know, they had no women in their um, U.S. side of, of, of the firm at the time. And I said, what are you doing about this? And I expected the same politically correct answer. And instead he said, well, we're looking very hard, but we're not prepared to lower our standards. On television. Um, and honestly, where, everywhere I went for like three months, people wanted to talk about that. And even if you just judge them on their actions and not what he said. This is a firm that had not hired a single woman in 44 years. Mm -hmm. You cannot tell me you couldn't find one that met your very high standards. Um, and so, you know, I'd never written a book before and I pitched this idea and my literary agent initially was like, ah, I don't know. Um, and I was like, okay, I guess I'm not gonna write a book. And um, a week later, she called me back and said, I take it back, I met an editor who worked in publishing and then went to work in tech for two years and it was so horrible for her that she went back to publishing and decided she was gonna try to find someone to write a book about it. Um, and so they really took a chance on me and um, I had, you know, I didn't know, I, I had no outline, I had no, I didn't write a proposal, it was very, it was really a journey, um, and I had some great advisors, one of whom said, well, if you know what the answer is right now or what the book should look like, then it's not worth writing a book about. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it, it sort of came together along the way, and I literally just started asking every single person I met, what's been your experience? What do you think is the problem? What, what can we do to change? Like, I would have, I would have been like, okay, tell me everything. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, you know, these themes sort of emerged based on those stories. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many things that you spoke about that I would love to touch on, but in the book you do really speak a lot about how um, we're an industry that prides ourselves on being a meritocracy. I'm very curious, you know, what exactly a meritocracy is and how that idea has failed us. Well, in my view, a true meritocracy is impossible to achieve. We all come to the plate with different levels of access and the escalator of life is moving faster for some of us than it is for others. And so there's no way to avoid that. Um, you know, in tech, you know, I think we see a lot of people getting opportunities because they look, up, look the part. And, you know, the, the book is called Rotopia, which I know makes a strong statement, but, you know, in my view, it, it sort of encapsulates this idea that in Silicon Valley, anyone can change the world and anyone can make their own rules if they're a man. But if you're a woman, it is incomparably harder. Um, and in fact, the idea of meritocracy, which is really interesting, um, the actual term was coined in the 1950s by a British sociologist who was actually using it to warn about you know, this, this future he saw coming where people would use their success to justify their success, essentially, and say, well, I'm successful, I must deserve it. Um, and that it would in increase inequality of opportunity. And actually 50 years later, he wrote an op-ed in The Guardian and said, I'm so disturbed by the use of this term meritocracy. It was actually meant as a bad thing. Yep. <laughs> and now people are, are trying to say it's a good thing. Um, and, you know, Kara Swisher has this great term. She says it's more of a meritocracy um, where people hire people who look like them. And I mean, I think the data shows that. Like, just look at the numbers. Look at the numbers in almost any company. And, you know, in, in my view, it was time to call bullshit. And thank you for calling bullshit. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and exactly that. So I'm curious with all these leaders who candidly speak, you know, in the background about what they believe in and then on camera they, they give you a very scripted response. How are they able to do this and actually get away with it when the numbers are not the, are the numbers? We have them. You know, I think it, it is really hard to look at a company like Facebook or Amazon or Google and say they're not good enough, right? You know, tech has created all of these wonderful and amazing things for sure. So it's, so it's sort of difficult to say, well, we should have been doing things differently. But I think, well, what if women had had a seat at the table 30 years ago? You know, I think about all the women who never got a chance to start the next Facebook or Google or Apple because they were women. Um, how different the world might be. And, you know, and some people, I, you know, I do believe care about this, but maybe don't care about it enough. This is something that needs to be an explicit priority, like one, two, or three. You know, Jeff Bezos may care about having a diverse workforce, but it doesn't care about it as much as, you know, building rocket ships and buying grocery stores and a speaker for your kitchen. Mm -hmm. But if he can do all those things, 
I also think that he can build a workforce that's 50-50. Um, I wrote an op-ed with a couple of colleagues in Business Week a few weeks ago where we sort of challenged Amazon and said, okay, you're looking for a new headquarters, HQ2, you're gonna create 50,000 new jobs from scratch. There's no reason that those jobs can't be 50-50 and that you can't represent people of color, at least in line with the local population. Um, and so we crunched all the numbers and, and looked at the cities on the short list and where they have the best STEM pipelines right now. And so it was an interesting exercise. Um, you know, but I, you know, this, isn't, this is something that so many of these visionaries and innovators have said, well, it's so hard. And yet they are tackling the world's hardest problems, except this one. <laughs> so I think, I think we can all do better. I agree. Yep. So uh, one of my favorite parts in the book is when you had a group of female engineers over to your house to discuss their personal experiences, um, which happened to be in the wake of the Susan Fowler incident. So many of your guests mentioned that in order to get the same recognition as their peers, they had to do an excep exceptional job on top of also showing why they were worth being there. Uh, I'm curious what was going through your head when you were hearing all of these stories? Yeah, so Susan Fowler's post came out when I was already like a year and a half into the book. And I had worked so hard to like get Sheryl Sandberg and Marissa Meyer to talk to me um, that I realized I hadn't done enough to talk to sort of women who are in the trenches, the rank and file doing this every day. And so I invited 12 engineers from a range of companies from like Google to Uber, startups, um, to my house for dinner. And they were so, I mean, on, it was one of the, it was so emotional and it was, there, it was, there were definitely some low moments, but it was also a high moment for me because I, I felt so grateful that they had been willing to share their stories. And I felt like it, like this, this, their experience sort of crystallized this idea that, you know, women in tech often feel that they have to do all of this emotional labor to prove that they deserve to be there. Because they're so isolated and they're often the only woman in the room over and over again, it's like proving that they deserve to be there, doing this emotional labor that they don't get credit for that's almost like an entire second job. Um, and it's exhausting. And honestly, the takeaway was they were exhausted and frustrated. And, um, you know, and there were some very egregious stories in this, in this discussion, which you can read. Um, a couple of the Uber engineers had some very, <laughs> really incredible stories. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the engineers from Uber, her name is Lydia Fernande Fernandez, um, she's transgender. And she, you know, for the first 20 years of her life, uh, she, she, she told a story about how for the first 20 years of her life when she was presenting as a man, her opinion seemed to be worth hearing. But when she made her transition and, and, and began presenting as a woman, suddenly people started interrupting her. And she was like, I have been on both sides of this table and this game is rigged. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's awesome. Um, and and it, honestly, it just so perfectly, I, I was just like, wow, I've never, like she just had this very unique window into what the experiences are, how experiences are different for men and, and, and women and, and what it's like to live that and why it can be so difficult for men who haven't lived that experience to understand it. Right, it's a very rare perspective, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, we got this question submitted and I thought it fit perfectly um, with what we're talking about. In this environment of apathy and subtle yet not so subtle hostility, how do you keep from just giving up and walking away? Well, I have felt incredible support and encouragement. I mean, I'm going around speaking to rooms full of people like you, and it like makes me feel like what I've done matters, you know? It's, it could have been like a Brotopia tree falling in a forest and no one cared. It really could have. And believe me, I walked into this process with open eyes. I have a couple of friends who are authors and they're like, you know, there could be a terrorist attack on the day you're supposed to be on the Today Show and no one will care. Um, luckily, that didn't happen for many reasons. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I do think that I, I benefited from the cultural conversation and I, my timing was, 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 was pretty good. Um, and, and I hear about all of these new initiatives like Founders for Change and Moving Forward where uh, uh, all raise, I don't know if, if, if you're, you're familiar with, you know, this, this group of female venture capitalists who I've known many of them for, you know, the last eight years and like eight years ago they would never have come on television. They were really, they didn't want to be the woman investor. And now they're owning it, you know, and they've gotten together and they've started a nonprofit where they're working to get more women in VC and more women funded and they were on the cover of Forbes and I'm like, so amazing. I mean, it is just so different from 
uh, what it was eight years ago. And then I don't know if any of you heard about this memo that recently came out from some dude at the University of Washington, which is kind of like James Damore 2.0. And this professor basically, it's called Why Women Can't Code or Why Women Won't Code. Um, and he basically was like, I think James Damore is right. And so, you know, those <laughs> things happen. And, and, and I, you know, I realize that we have a lot more work to, to do. I, you know, and I, I generally believe that those people with the most extreme opinions are in the minority. Mm -hmm. And that the vast majority of people would like to see this things change, but don't understand how, or don't understand quite how important it is. And my job is to try to help them see yeah. the light. Guide them <laughs> along the way. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so exactly, like unintentionally, sometimes these discussions discourage men or others from coming when, they, uh, when it's really helpful for them to actually join the conversation. So why should this book and this issue be of interest to everybody? I mean, first of all, everybody needs to be part of this conversation. Women can't do this by themselves. Um, I do think some of the, you know, greatest ways to make change are grassroots efforts. You know, like you starting this conversation. You know, I had an employee come up to me at one of these things yesterday. I was like, how can I, how can I do that? I was like, honestly, like you can start something. You can start something in your organization. And by the way, no one wants to say no to things like this right now. So I'm sure your boss would be like, yeah, 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 you do that. <laughs> um, so, you know. But that said, I do think we need to invite everyone to, to be part of these conversations and we need to make them safe spaces to, to, to discuss. Um, and, you know, I know that there are pe people out there and men out there who are scared and don't understand and don't know if they can give you a hug or say your dress looks nice. I mean, all <laughs> you know, in general, I think most people know where the line is. And uh, if a line is crossed when someone is made to feel uncomfortable, mm -hmm. um, that said, I do think you know we're in this transition period where just talking about it is is okay, and we're we're going to learn from that, and we're going to get to a better place, and we're we're going to sort of still sort of know where the line is. We're just going to not get anywhere close to it, right? Um, but I've been honestly, so many m men too have been supportive and um, want to know what they can do to help. And you know, I I had another CEO invite me to talk at his company, and you know, he's like, I know we have a problem. I I don't know what to do. Like help help us, mm -hmm. and I don't have all the answers, by the way. But um, you know, afterwards, three female employees walked up to him and said, "Okay, we're resigning if the next engineer you hire isn't a woman." <laughs> and he was like, uh, "Like he's like, oh crap! I just opened <laughs> Pandora's box." And he was like, "I'm gonna get, I'm gonna we're gonna go out of business." And, and I was like, "No, you're not. Just look just harder. harder. You're gonna find. They're out there. I promise. I promise you, they're there." Great, thank you. And I think this is something that definitely everybody could weigh in on. Um, if you guys have any opinions about, you know, how we can change the discussion around this so that we get, you know, more encouragement and involvement. Yeah, I would love to hear your experiences as well. It may not be quite the Uber experience, but <laughs> no, my ex my personal experience has been uh, relatively positive. Uh, I do get sometimes. I I started my career as an engineer. And in six years, I become the first female software architect in my company. And that time, I was in uh, the group of a six core uh, architects. Um, so that was a that I can't say people are being unfair to me, right? So I I rose pretty I rose pretty quickly. Um, but there are there were also people in the company saying, "Oh, she's an engineer because her husband is also in engineering." It's like really Did this how. <laughs> How else am I going to prove to you? I'm, I'm already there. Um, but yet people will say that, no, so basically during the day I will work, uh, all the questions, I will save it up and bring it home, and then say, hey, has <laughs> 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 Is that what you do? <laughs> 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 yeah. No, that's not here at all. <laughs> I mean, the original question too around like how do we how do we change it? I mean, I, I think this is just an awesome first step, right? And I mean, I think we just I think for me, it's interesting being a woman who has you know worked my whole life and has tried really hard to grow and 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 advance in my career and and balance things at home. Um, you know, it's it's always challenging, but but for me, it was just so eye opening to kind of see all of this information and and the situation that is is pretty rampant condensed in this one this one volume um, and to see that you know gosh I think 
yeah, the first step is just just being aware of how how broad and deep the the challenges are, and to to be mindful of, of how we can how we can yeah start having this conversation around it. Great, thank you. Um, so, a shocking this is something that you touched on at the beginning, but um, a very shockingly low number of female-led companies receive funding from venture capitalists. Um, just last year, only 1.9 billion out of the 85 billion, which, which comes out to about 2%, was given to female-led startups. So I would love all of your guys' perspectives on, and opinions on um, why you think this happens and if you've ever found yourself in a similar situation. So, you know, <laughs> the numbers are just so, they're just so staggering when, when, when you lay them out there. Um, Words like visionary and genius, we don't use those words to describe women. You know, I can think of dozens and dozens of men that we just were like, he's a genius. We don't, we don't say that about women. And I mean, so I think there is certainly a cultural issue here. Um, when you look at the research, men, qualities that are seen as positive in men are seen as negative in women, entrepreneurs. So a man who's pitching a business idea, if he's young, he's considered high potential. A woman pitching an idea who's young is considered inexperienced. If a man is cautious, it's like, oh, that's kind of unique. That's a good thing. If a woman is cautious, it's like, oh, my goodness, she can't do it. And so when inve investors, A, you know, we all know about pattern matching, but, you know, when they're looking at a male entrepreneur, they're simply making a, you know, risk-benefit calculation in their head. You know, do we like this idea? Can this person execute? And with a woman, it's like, but can she do it? Does she have what it takes? And, you know, often so many female entrepreneurs have told me that, investors ask about their kids or if they're going to have kids and what their family situation is and guys have kids too you know and dads actually like are doing a lot more work at home um and so uh, i mean it is not just about how many women are getting funding it's about how much funding they're getting and so we don't have enough stories of female founded success because they haven't been given a chance it's it's not just about whether they got a check it's about how much money they got because that means they have you know s this many chances to fail and figure it out right um, you know, a, a Jennifer Hyman, who's the CEO of Rent the Runway in, in 2016, that got like $200 million in funding, and she got the most funding of any female entrepreneur. And Uber, I think, raised $20 billion that year. <laughs> and so, you know, a, a, obviously a company, like we've seen Uber make a lot of mistakes, haven't we? They couldn't have made those mistakes if they didn't have all that money to fall back on. I actually have some pretty direct personal experience with this. So my last company before I joined Prosper Works was a company called Ruby Ribbon. Um, it's a woman's uh, apparel company. And the economics of the business are actually pretty cool. It's a um, direct sales model. And the growth that you can get on an organic basis is pretty explosive with the right amount of investment up front. So it's very high LTV, very low CAC, right? This is what we talk about here on a, on a fairly regular basis about, you know, getting our LTV to CACs in the right way. But it was a women-led business, women founded. The entire management team was women. In fact, I think 90% of the company was women, um, maybe 95%. And I tell you what, we marched up and down Sand Hill for almost a year trying to raise money. And we were hanging on by our fingernails. And I mean, it was just brutal. And you think about it, you're going and sitting in front of a room full of guys. And you're talking about women's underpants, basically. And it's a revolutionary product, right? It actually could change, like we had the before and after photos and the testimony of this product truly changing women's lives, and they didn't get it. I bet they all came for the pitch, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's, it was real. It was hard, man. And, um, you know. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, so my tiny little bit of experience, my startup experience, it didn't even go as we <laughs> We, we had some ideas, I have something wrote out, then we said, well, how likely are we to get funding? And just that moment, we check, I checked my LinkedIn, and there's an article um, from the, I forgot her name, but it's the founder of Muse. She's talking about her venture capital experience. I think she said she tried 140 sometimes, uh, 140 some pitches to get funding. I look at that number, and she was saying it's so hard to sit there over a hundred times listening to people telling her how her idea sucks, how she will never succeed. Over a hundred times and she's still trying. I read that, it's like, you know what, we're not doing this. I can't, <laughs> I can't handle this. I think also venture capitalists are looking, you know, I, I, they're totally ent entitled to pick ideas that they feel really passionate about. And, 
you know, sometimes they just don't understand or feel passionate about women's apparel, right? That's their prerogative. But, you know, it, it doesn't mean that there isn't a huge business opportunity there. And the problem is that most investors are, are men. And they're also making a, deci a decision about who do they want to spend time with and, like, get into an, a relationship with for 5, 10, 15 years. And, you know, people are more likely to choose people like them when getting into relationships. Uh, Hi. <laughs> so we first off need more women on the VC boards for sure. Um, but you did touch in the book a little bit about how limited partners are actually very key in this. So they are the ones that provide the funds to the VCs who then invest in the entrepreneurs. Um, there was a little bit of studies about how there actually are more female board members of the limited partners. I'm curious why they're not being held accountable. And So LPs are the investors who fund VCs. Oh, sorry. And no, no, no. I'm just explaining because it's kind of confusing. Um, and they're called limited partners. And actually... I sort of expected limited partners to be just as male dominated as VCs, but actually there are more women um, among limited partners. And interestingly, when you, when you talk to most limited partners, they say, well, we care about diversity, but we really care about returns. So like I put a gun, like I literally have a quote from a woman who says, I put a gun to my head before I wouldn't invest in Sequoia or Benchmark because they don't have a women, woman. Um, and so, you know, that's a really difficult mentality to change, especially when, you know, Benchmark and Sequoia have been very successful in, in investors. Um, LPs also have historically been completely silent. They don't talk to the press. They're very difficult uh, to get in touch with. They'll, they'll, they, will, they will also tell you when you, when you get them on the phone um, that they don't feel like they have the power in the situation. So, you know, they're often trying to chase these funds to get their money in. Um, and so they're not going to not invest in Andreessen Horowitz, you know, for these reasons. Um, that said, um, I, we've seen some small movements in the LP community to care more about diversity. Um, Melinda Gates is now um, really taking on the cause of women in tech, and she's an LP. And so she recently funded uh, Aspect Ventures, which was founded by Teresa Go and Jennifer Fonstad, two, like, incredible women investors. Um, and, like... She did it because they're great investors who are women. And I think that's okay. And then you have some, some VCs out there like Chamath Palihapitiya of Social Capital, um, he's a big talker. Um, and he, he has this theory that, you know, there's going to be a big shakeup in venture capital and that diversity is going to lead to better results. And so in 10 years, like, maybe we'll be able to see some of these firms with a different strategy if it pays off. Um, so in some some of the studies in the book as well. In 1984, women received 40% of computer science degrees, but in 2016, it went down to only 22%. Why do you think the numbers have dropped so drastically? So this to me was like the smoking gun. Um, women were there in the early computing industry and they kind of got pushed and profiled out. So if you go back to the 1940s and 50s, men were prime primarily the hardware makers, but women were very well represented among computer programmers. And they were programming computers for the military and programming computers for NASA, and it really was like hidden figures, but industry-wide. And then in the 60s and 70s, as the industry was starting to explode, they were so desperate for new talent that they started doing these personality tests and aptitude tests to identify good programmers. And they decided that good programmers, quote, don't like people. That, that, that makes so much sense, doesn't it? Um, um, <laughs> and, and, and the reality is there's no evidence to support the idea that people who don't like people are better at this job than people who do, but that more men might fall into that category. Um, and so women essentially got profiled out of an industry where they were thriving. And so in 1984, as you said, women were earning 37% of computer science degrees. That has plummeted to 18%, where it's been flat for the last decade. And yes, there is a pipeline problem, but it, in my argument, the tech industry created the pipeline problem. And today they reinforce the pipeline problem. So all of these companies who say, oh, well, we're trying, but it's a pipeline problem. Um, sure, there's a pipeline problem, but it's, all, it's you know, you, they cannot absolve themselves of responsibility because these young women can't be what they can't see. Definitely. Um, Jessica, I know that you had mentioned in your studies in China that you noticed a lot more gender parity. Why do you think it is so different here and what was your experience like? 
Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I travel to India and China and other countries. Actually, I see more women engineers. I don't, I don't know why we have less here. Uh, I would expect more here. You know, my, my naive analysis is that the women in other countries didn't get that profile test, so they're still following the old kind, the old-fashioned way that I think uh, computer science is a pretty pro appropriate thing for women. I mean, I've heard anecdotally about more women en engineers and entrepreneurs in China. Um, I, you know, there are some isolated examples, like Alibaba has a really um, female, a really gender balanced executive team because Jack Ma has made it a priority. You know, I would say that generally you see this pattern repeated in different countries, and China has other <laughs> cultural, gender cultural issues, so it's not quite apples to apples. Um, but I want to see the numbers. Definitely. <laughs> want to see the numbers. Yeah, I'm curious if there's any steps that we could take to learn from these other cultures that are doing it successfully. But you're right in saying that it, it's not apples to apples. Right. So. Um, I'm curious, though, if it's severe in other industries. Like, why is this an issue that is so prevalent in Silicon Valley? And how do we compare to the other ones out there? Yeah. Well, so sexism is, exists everywhere, as we've seen. Um, over the last year. Uh, but what's interesting is I had so many people when I started writing this book say, oh, well, Silicon Valley can't possibly be worse than Wall Street. I'm like, well, actually it is. Um, on Wall Street, women actually make up half the employees at, at banks. They have a lot of work to do in the, in, in the leadership positions, but it's a lot better than 20, 25% here in Silicon Valley. Um, and why it matters is because you guys are building the future. I mean, I can't, Think of another industry that has a bigger impact on, on how we live and is literally changing our lives every single day, which is why it's even more important to have people of all backgrounds to be filling these jobs. I mean, we can't have 95% of the decisions here being made by men. Yeah. Um, and you know, in Silicon Valley in particular, I think that a lot of wealth and power has been created in a very short span of time. And that has led to a sense of entitlement and arrogance that has sort of blinded folks to understanding how they really are part of the problem. Um, and, and I don't think that we can really, the, the book is, is about how and why we got here and what we can do to change it. We can't just fast forward to, okay, what can we do to change it? I think we really need to understand what we've been doing wrong. And I, until some folks sort of recognize, well, actually, I kind of, I failed women. <laughs> Now, what can I do to change it? Um, that's when we'll move forward. Yeah. That's great. And MG, I'm curious, in your um, being in the financial um, industry, did you notice any difference moving between tech and other realms, or is it more prevalent in tech specifically? You know, it's interesting. I started my career in investment banking, um, but it was in a small group. And actually, yeah, I was the only woman on the team. Um, after after um, investment banking, I was at Yahoo. And I have to say, I think Yahoo actually did a pretty good job of being um, fairly balanced. Although, I say that too, I was on a biz ops team and I was literally actually with Eugene. I think I was the only woman <laughs> on the team too. Um, and in my, in my uh, w with the exception of Ruby Ribbon, the other startups I've been at, um, I have to say I'm, I'm oftentimes the only woman in the room on the exec staff or maybe one of a couple. Um, so it is, it is something that I see and I, I've definitely experienced. Um, but I think at this point in my career, I've, I've kind of become comfortable with it and comfortable in, the, in that role of being the sole, the sole female voice in the room. I also think Wall Street kind of went through this in the 80s and 90s. And now they're in a better place because they've sort of worked out a lot of these issues. And not, it's not certainly not perfect, but actually it's proof that things can change. You know, it doesn't have to be this way. Do we know how they did it? <laughs> well, I mean, I think part of it is just making sure you have HR and, and, and people who are tracking these things. Like, every company should be collecting data on, well, tracking the you know, kinds of people they're hiring, how much they're paying people. I mean, the pay gap in Silicon Valley in computer programming is five times the national average. Come on. Like, for an industry that loves data, just look at your own numbers. And that's one of the easiest things, in my view, to change is just, Pay people fairly. Pay people fairly. Um, 
I got this question received a lot about you know how us women can navigate through the pressures of getting married, having a kid, running a business, basically doing it all. Um, what is your advice to a female in the position that feels like they're getting left behind? Well, so first of all, I think it's important to work in an organization that is supportive and, and to have a team that is supportive. I think every woman who has a child wonders how they're gonna do it. Um, and I, of course, had that moment. Um, and I had many successful women. I actually reached out to many successful women. I, one of them is Sheryl Sandberg, and I tell this story in the book, who are like, um, yes, you can do it, and you will do it. Um, you will do it, like, you're, you'll figure it out. Um, you know, but I do think that having, an, you know, a culture and, a, and managers who understand um, that, you know, maybe, maybe you leave a little early to pick up your kids, but you're back online at night, and that time is valued just as much as someone who's staying here till whatever, 10 o'clock. Um, and that's something that men and women want. It's not just women. Women are twice as likely to quit tech as men, but they're not going, they're not leaving the workforce. They're taking jobs in other fields. So there's this idea that they're like leaving to take care of kids, but actually they're not. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, having good, I don't know, I don't know what your policies are, but I'm not like a huge fan of dinner and ping pong tables, and I just don't know, I don't know, you know, what, what, what purpose that serves. Um, you know, every co company will find their own what's right for them and what works for their set of values. Um, but, you know, it's, I think there's, you know, we, we, racism is a whole nother book. Ageism, I think, is underreported in technology, but companies should be looking for people, for people that, you know, want to stay over the course of a long career. This is such a competitive industry. You're not just looking for millennials right out of college or catering to a, to a certain demographic. And I think tech did that for a really long time. I mean, look at Facebook. It looks like a college dorm, dorm room. Um, and so, um, you know, Slack is one of the case studies in the book where, you know, I, I, I see a lot of positive things in what they're doing. And their motto is work hard and go home. Um, I kind of like that. <laughs> Let me go home. <laughs> uh, no, um, I would love to hear your weigh in on this, regardless of you know family status or anything like that. How you guys feel? You make sure you have a seat at the table and you're not being left behind. I mean, for me, I, my oldest is now eight, and so I've had a few years to kind of work through this. And and I think with every company that I've I've been at since I've I've had kids, I've been really straightforward about. It. I was like, look, yeah, I leave at five thirty and I have dinner with my kids. Full stop. Like. If that's a problem, then this probably isn't the right place for me. And yes, of course, I get back online. The, kid, the girls go down at 8.30, and then I'm back online till you know, as long as I need to be. Um, and I think kind of that proving that point, too, that's like, okay, I, I can still deliver. I'm in the office 9 to 5.30. And, you know, being in finance, like, that is, that is a role where you need to be in the office. A lot happens organically and, and in the moment that, you know, this role in particular, I feel like, has to largely be on site. But, yeah, I go home, and I see my kids, and I turn off my phone for a couple of hours, and then, yeah, I'm back online online responding to whatever fire drill came up in the last prior two hours you know so um, so yeah I just make and you just make it work right and I think also having a, a good partnership with my husband to be like hey you know we've got a sick kid I got a board meeting today so guess what like you, you're gonna have to, to to you know take take little little one to the doctor's office and you know we've we've just worked through that as well yeah and to me that the family working together is the key uh, support for me like my husband and I always work it out like if this week I do it and next week you do especially when my son is is little you know if he has a fever then you're gonna be out of the fever and out of the daycare for at least 24 hours so that's like when whenever he's sick you know three days are gone so we have to we went through the days my husband and I calculating days how many sick days you have left how many <laughs> sick days I have left <laughs> So, but we work together and th those years will pass and you go beyond that and then things are much better. But, you know, we just work, work through it. I also, I mean, I'd be lying if I said I had it figured out and felt great all the time. I feel like I'm <laughs> always kind of like doing this and that's like my like, that's like my every day, my equilibrium yeah. is this. Um, but you know, people, you know, it might not be, you might not have kids, you might have a plant that you need to water, or maybe you want to go for a run, or feed your dog. Like, I think having a life outside of work is okay, and in tech, 
we've had this like blending of personal and professional where in, in some cases it's not had had good results and I think you know creating a place where employees can feel like they can bring their whole selves to work and also lead a life outside of work is really important that's great um, I think we're coming down to our last question just so we can save some time for the audience to ask um, but Personally, I've been walking around with your book a lot and getting a lot of people asking, oh, I've been wanting to read this. I'm so excited. You know, what can we do? Do you get any eye rolls? I'm just curious. <laughs> if so, I just smack them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, not yet. Um, but because you've been touring this book for a little bit of time now, have you noticed any change that's been directly from the light that you've shed? Well, so one thing that I really didn't expect was to be invited to speak at tech companies. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I guess I kind of thought, oh, the book is called Brotopia, people are going to be like, no, thank you very much. Um, and, you know, I've gone to speak at Amazon and Microsoft and YouTube and places that could easily say, like, you know, you're not welcome here. And, yes, it's a self-selecting audience, and um, these are very large companies, but, you know, the employees come up and to the mic and they're, like, fired up and they want to make a difference, and that's so awesome. Like, that has been so encouraging and everyone wants to know what they can do differently and how they can be part of it um and so you know i i, I feel really good like i i, I it's not like it's going to be easy um you know this is going to be a long process but you know i i think the conversation is happening and we've seen more change in the last six months to a year than we've seen in 50 years so that's good enough for me yeah. came at the right time for sure <laughs> Um, so I'm going to let Maya pass the mic around. If anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand and she will. Great shirt. Hi, my name is Irina. Um, I, I work in tech, I guess <laughs> all, everyone does here. I used to be a co-founder of a startup. Um, I think one thing that really helped, I was, uh, we were really early stage, started with zero money, was having my co-founder really support me. And he was not my husband or my partner, he was literally just a co-founder. We did get asked more or less in every investment investor meeting, we got asked, are you guys, a part are you guys partners? That might be a problem. And I'm sure if there was a guy, they wouldn't have asked that, even though there could be gay couples and everything else. <laughs> So we had to defend ourselves even in those moments when we we're like bootstrapped and sharing a room in like four of us. And they're like, are you sure there's nothing happening there? So there was a lot of questions that were inappropriate and really just embarrassing. But besides that, one thing that I really want to ask is what I realized that as a, a woman in tech or younger, younger girl in tech, was really hard to get a mentor as a woman because you do want to look up at somebody who's five, six, ten years ahead. And I have to admit that when reaching out to men and say, you know, we, we have this great idea, we're trying to find new investors, we're trying to get support and advise, advisors, we will get more men responding to that. And actually from women, we have very few of them, and Ursula was one of them who helped us back in the days. But uh, it was really hard to find somebody who was even like from the same industry, two, three, four years ahead to get help. So why is that? Why do we think that older women are harder to uh, even get a response from or just get them to be our mentors? Um, well, <laughs> something else I heard often on my journey was, are you going to write a chapter about mean girls and mean bosses, <laughs> mean, mean women bosses? And I was like, you know, I think because there are so few women bosses, there's this trope of the mean female boss. But there's like mean men bosses too. Um, we just have many more examples of, of, of male leadership. And so I was like, no, I'm not going to write that. Um, Sheryl Sandberg wrote a great article in the New York Times about how when there's one woman on a board or on an executive team, she's much more likely to be competitive with other women because she thinks there's only room for one. But when there's three women on the board or executive team, they're much more likely to help each other. And I do think women have had to go it alone for a really long time. That said, I mean, I've seen so much collaboration among women in, the, in this industry in the last year. And like, I would hope that we are moving into a new phase. I mean, All Raise is a group of 35 women venture capitalists who are competitors. And they're now helping each other. Like, th two years ago, that wouldn't have ever happened. Um, I do think that we all need to be better about mentoring and, and advocating for others, and men especially. 
but anyone who has some amount of power to pass or some amount of knowledge to share. Um, I have benefited from male and female mentors, and I've often had to be like the squeaky wheel, like, hey, I really need your help on something, can you chat? Um, and generally, I think if people sort of see potential and see that they're working hard, they'll at least give you some of their, some of their time. But like, I do think there's a, a real onus on you know, people with power, and especially men right now, to share some of it and, and f find young people that you see with potential and help them. Um, you know, the other thing is, you know, it can be very hard to speak up for yourself if you're the, like, victim, if you're the one getting interrupted or you're the one getting mansplained. But if you see someone getting interrupted or not getting an opportunity, you can also speak up for them. Um, and it can be a lot more impactful to say, like, hey, like, I saw that happen and I actually don't think that was cool. Or, hey, why don't you give that, that project to so-and-so? I think she'd do a great job. Um, and so I think advoc advocacy is something that can be really powerful, especially in an organization. I know in your fundraising it can be a lot harder because you're like, you're out there on their, your own, but there are these, I, f I, I feel like recently formed female networks that I'm hoping are stronger and, and would be more helpful to a person like you today. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned you know, all the progress that's happened in the last year or so. So I'm kind of curious as to why, um, why it's picked up so much steam in, in the past year versus um, before that, given that a lot of the information we're acting off of, I think some of us have known for a while. So what makes it different? And then what's, what is um, the male's role in this beyond just kind of retweeting and, and sharing? Um, That's a good first yeah. step. <laughs> yeah, beyond that. Yeah. Very low effort. Um, so, if you think back to 2012 when Ellen Powell filed her lawsuit against Kleiner Perkins, she was really, public opinion was not on her side. Um, and she actually lost in court. But, so that was in 2015 that the verdict came out. She, she kind of by that point had won in the court of public opinion even though she had lost in court. Now, I, I think if she brought her case today, the, the verdict could have been different. Um, so I do think a huge part of the, the sea change has been Ellen Powell and Susan Fowler. And Susan Fowler coming forward and, and you know, writing this very detailed memo, documentation about what happened to her. Um, and I don't think anyone could have foresaw that that would have led to Travis Kalanick getting kicked out of his own company. Um, there was that, and then it, it followed with a series of really incredible reporting from a lot of different news organizations about various investors, um, which all preceded Harvey Weinstein, by the way. Um, and I think the women who came forward in those situations were emboldened by people like Susan Fowler and may not have told their stories if she hadn't. Um, and as a journalist who's been on the other side, you know, we have so, I get, I have a pile of tips on my desk that I will never, I mean, stories that I'll never be able to do because even doing like, one story about a particular individual is really hard. You're talking about someone's career and their livelihood and people who are scared and trying to convince them to go on the record. It's really, really hard. Um, but I, I do think, you know, with a couple like Justin Caldbeck and I did a story about Shervin Pishavar and, you know, those took a lot, I mean, there were, th those took months months um but i do think they help more dominoes fall um what can men do um be supportive listen retweet that's great um i do think it's really on the leaders of of these organizations that they, they, it's very difficult for change to happen if the ceo hasn't bought in and so I, I talk a lot about slack um you know stuart butterfield has made this an explicit priority. And he's the first one to say, like, I know I'm a white dude and I'm really privileged. <laughs> um, and so, like, a lot of things are easier for me. Um, and he tweets, about, <laughs> tweets, he tweets about it. He's made it an explicit focus of the company. Everybody at the organization knows it's something he, that, that he cares about. They have, as such, diversified the recruiting team, structured the interview process, changed the job descriptions. They say in the job descriptions that they care about this. Every time he tweets, they get a spike in inbound interest. Every time he tweets that he cares about finding people of different backgrounds, people who care to, to be part of that are attracted to it. Um, and so a lot of it, for companies, it's about giving them, if you just focus on 
raising awareness about bias or unconscious bias training, it's not necessarily gonna have a huge impact because it's really hard to say to someone, oh, just change the way you think about women. Okay, you watch the video, check, like, all good. Um, but if you give people the tools to combat their bias, that can have an impact. So maybe you say, we can't even start interviewing for the role until we have two qualified female candidates and two candidates of color. Or you certainly can't hire for the role until you've interviewed a diverse slate of candidates. I, I'm pretty sure that in all of those situations, you wouldn't always choose you know, the first white man that you see. Um, you, you'd have a more diverse slate of candidates to choose from, and you'd pick the best person, whoever that is. I don't, I don't work here, so I'll take this opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a consultant in diversity and inclusion um, and an organizational psychologist, and it's very frustrating sometimes to try to enact changes. And one of the questions that I often get when I'm doing panels and things like that are, is it better to change people's behavior by changing infrastructure, by changing um, the way, the environment that people are acting in, or is it better to try to directly change their attitudes about this stuff? And I'm, I'm curious about your take. I have a maybe too complex answer. I, I certainly want to know your take. Um, but I do get asked the question of, well, a lot of companies say they're doing stuff, but are they doing it just because of public pressure and does that matter? Sure, it would be great if everyone was doing this because they believe that the world will be better and their businesses will make more money and be more innovative if they have you know, a gender balanced workforce. But that, I know that's not the case. Some people are doing this because like, they have to. Um, I'm of the mind that any change in the right direction is, is, is good change. And in order for a real culture shift to happen, the numbers have to change. And so whether that happens because employees have been given these tools and they're being told to like track the numbers, to me almost doesn't matter because if the numbers actually shift, that's when the culture will actually start to change. So if you have like 10 men around a dinner table, the conversation will be a certain way. If you add a woman, it might change like a teeny bit. And if it's half and half, it's a completely different conversation. That is the culture shift that I'm talking about? I I'm curious for your take. Um, I, I tend to agree with you because I, I think I get a lot of pushback on this as well, that if you change the infrastructure of something, then you're kind of forcing people to adapt. It's in that short term period where it gets really complicated because people don't like adapting. They don't like change. Um, and so how you actually navigate that change becomes a really important part of the conversation. So I do think it's two-sided. You have to change attitudes towards change mm -hmm. before you can actually enact that change. But I do agree with you that the infrastructure is a really important part of actually changing the game for people. So I'll give you an example from Bloomberg, which Bloomberg is happy to talk about, so um, it's okay to share. Um, you know, I've, this is something that I've always cared about and I've sort of, you know, when I'm building a show every day, like, oh, we should really try to get, like, a woman on the show. Um, and, you know, people would be like, okay. Um, and then <laughs> our editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite, um, basically wrote a mandate that was like, we need more women on television, we need more women in our stories, and we're going to start counting them. And my whole team was like, okay. And now, I mean, there's so much, they're so excited when we, when we find these amazing new women that we hadn't interviewed before. Bloomberg's also... We have a training program to media train women who maybe haven't been on television before or talk to the press to get them media ready. And we get asked to do a ton of panels. And I'm sure you've all heard of the manal, the all male panel. <laughs> We're not allowed to do manals. <laughs> so if we get asked to moderate a manal, we have to say, well, I can't until you invite another woman. So that's, you know, by hook or by crook. <laughs> And I, I think my show is better. Our show is better, bec our show is better because of it. Hey, so uh, I just started here last week, but... Uh, <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um, you know, you mentioned that, uh, like, you know, we need to fill the pipeline and, uh, you know, CS degrees are pretty low right now in graduation rates. Uh, like, they're higher than some of the uh, engineering departments I've seen around the valley, but... Um, like, what do you think of the uh, programs? Like at LinkedIn, we had a we were working on a program to like focus on non-traditional backgrounds, uh, because uh, the women I personally know in tech, most of them are going to App Academy and like giving up their public school teacher lives to go work in tech because uh, you know they want to have a career that uh, is taking care of them. But like, 
on the interview side of things, I am constantly seeing that like those kinds of um, resumes can't even get into the funnel in the first place. Uh, they're like that expectation. Like, um, do you see any movement on uh, you know re redefining what that background is that people are are looking for, like that type? Yeah. So I don't know what the program you're referencing on LinkedIn. Uh, it's involves. called uh, Reach. Uh, it was uh, an apprenticeship program. So. Um, Instead of uh, sending a resume, you would send uh, a code sample, you link to your GitHub, and you know some essay questions. Uh, and we wouldn't look at the resume. It was like something we weren't allowed to view uh, as people reviewing those uh, applications. So LinkedIn's numbers, first of all, are pretty good and, and better than the industry average. I think f for many of the, the jobs that we're talking about, you don't necessarily need a computer science proper degree. And so it's about not lowering your standards, but changing the standards and thinking about what do we actually need someone to know in order to do this job, and can they learn it? Um, and so Redfin is a really good example of a company that they had 15 engineers, one was a woman, and they s created basically a training program, similar to, sounds like what you're mentioning at LinkedIn, where they would take women who were maybe mid-career, or maybe they just did, did, a co did a coding course somewhere, and they would bring them in and train them and then funnel them out to different parts of the organization, and now they're 35% women. I mean, a lot of people start a job not knowing it. They, they've never done that particular job before, right? Um, and so we're all learning on the job a little bit. And so I do think that in the interest of creating a more diverse workforce that we think is going to be better and make better decisions and it, it can be, in fact, it, it is worth spending a little bit of extra time developing that workforce. Like maybe it takes you three months to find that woman and, and you could easily hire someone else in, in three weeks. But in my mind, in three years, you're gonna, that's gonna be paying off. Because <laughs> Dick Costolo, who uh, was the CEO of Twitter, um, when he went to start his new company, you know, he learned at Twitter, he was like, yeah, it was like 95,000% men. And you know, it's really hard to change once you get so big. It's like trying to turn an aircraft carrier around. So at his next startup, he was like, I'm not gonna hire another man until I hire a woman. So every hire was like one for one. And he was like, we actually moved faster because we didn't, well, like when we were like debating a new feature, we could just ask people in the room what they thought. We didn't have to like go on the street and like ask women like what they thought. <laughs> um, and so it, it, it actually can be a huge benefit. I mean, and I think in general, like, we all come from different, we all live different lives and like diversity of thought is so important. And if you don't have it, you're gonna miss things. And nobody wants to miss things. Is this on? Okay. Have you ever looked at other industries, um, specifically fashion or music? Just curious, your take. And um, so I haven't done, you know, specific research on those. I mean, I've definitely heard a lot about the music industry and how, especially if you're a, like a female performer and some of the things that you're expected to do, um, it sounds like it can be quite brutal. It sounds like a lot of industries don't have fun stories to tell. Um, the, the apparel industry is interesting because you have a lot of male CEOs designing women's clothes and bras, like that makes sense. Um, so I think it's, an, I mean, it's certainly another uh, interesting case in point. Um, Stitch Fix, Katrina Lake is a big, big character. Who's that? Are you guys trying to tell me something? <laughs> I'll stop. Oh god. Glad to know you're going to be really productive after this. Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm so embarrassed. Um. <laughs> Don't touch me, guys. <laughs> it's back. It's back. <laughs> Uh, Katrina Lake is, is, is uh, one of the featured characters in my book and she, you know, she's the founder of Stitch Fix and she had the same story trying to raise money from early investors and every, like she, she pitched 50 people who all said no. And like they just went public at a $2 billion valuation and most of the time it was like they didn't understand. It was like a women's thing. But last I checked guys wear clothes too. And they've since expanded into men's clothing and now children's and plus size and maternity. And like, it, it, you know, a lot of people are kicking themselves that they said no. Thank you guys. Oh, sorry. So we're running. 
pretty uh, short on time. We only have about 15 minutes until Emily has to leave. So we wanted to save a little bit of time for book signing, yeah. photos, anything else that you guys would like. Um, but thank you so much for joining. It really means the world to all of us. So thank you so much for having me.